happy to be here, healthy and strong as we are, to think that there's many people today who could not come to the services because of sickness and many bad things. And death kept some away, and sickness kept others away, and disappointments kept others away, but God has brought us together again yeah. to serve him. We're so happy for these things. And now, uh, coming together, I'd like to just say a few words about our last meeting overseas where you all prayed so hard for us that yeah. the Lord would give us the great service he did. And we're so happy if you report that many souls were saved. That's the main thing, souls being saved born in the kingdom of God. We, you know, we, the preaching of the cross brings uh, observation, it brings trouble, it brings stir-ups, and we can't expect to be immune from all those. We just have to take them as they come. Amen. So we, we had some trouble when we left Zurich. Now, I might explain what it was. Uh, the church, the first reformer, uh, was Martin Luther, as we all know, and second was Swingley. And Swingley went into, to, out of, into Switzerland, and there at Zurich was the Bible first translated in English, uh, the full Bible. From the first translation was it at Zurich, Switzerland. They still hang with the old Swingley idea, and Swingley's translation denies the virgin birth. He doesn't believe in the virgin birth. They said that he was the son of Joseph, called the son of God. And we believe that he was the son of God, that he was born of the Father God, that uh, gave him his birth through creation. And uh, Billy Graham, well known, everyone knows him nearly, he was in there for one day before I was, and if they didn't criticize that poor boy, just making fun of him where it didn't, they didn't need to be. They said he put a permanent wave in his hair and said he come to the church like he was going to a bandbox instead of the church and said he preached like a fantastic American soap salesman and, and um, said you can smell him ten feet away with perfume and just all things like that. Just making fun of the boy because why? He didn't deserve that. I heard Billy was right there. He preached the supreme deity of the Lord yeah, Jesus right. Christ. That's right. Yeah. He said, there's many men who can stand up and philosophers and so forth, but Jesus Christ is God himself manifested yeah. in the flesh. Brother, I hollered amen as loud as I could. <laughs> well, I know that's true. I believe that. Well, of course, me seeing the way they treated him, I dropped right into his place. Started right on with the supreme deity that Jesus Christ was yeah. Jehovah God manifested in flesh. Well, in doing that, the Lord gave us 50,000 souls. And that the five nights meeting. And then when they heard we were going up into Germany, now there is state and church. What the church tells the state, the state does. It, and we've often taught about many times if I have someone here, it's a Catholic friend, I don't say this now to be shoving your church at all. No, sir. I have thousands and tens of thousands of Catholic friends. But we've often thought in the early days when the Catholic Church united with the church and state together in the days of papal Rome and what a persecution it brought. Well, brother, the Protestant is just as bad and not worse. The yeah. Protestant church treated me twice as bad as the Catholic church ever did treat me. Amen. Yeah. So then when they went up there and sent into Germany and told the German authorities not to receive me, that I was absolutely against the teaching and I wasn't nothing but an imposter and not to receive me, and they'd build a stadium there that seated 30,000 people when they refused me to have the regular football stadium, well, because of the state being owned and Hitler built it there, then they went out and put a canvas cathedral up that would seat around 30,000, opened up the side so he could still set them on back. Somewhere we'd get 30,000 under roof. And they sent word that, that I was an imposter and not to receive me at all. And um, so then the government sat right down and said, thumbs down, I can't come in. Dr. Guckenbuehl, a friend which, uh, uh, national attorney sent word down there and went down there and said, no, sir, he cannot come in. We will not receive him. So uh, he goes down. It's in the American zone at, part, at, um, at uh, 
Karlsruhe, which means Charles Rest. They went down there to the colonel of the American Army, which is the American occupied zone in there. And he went to the colonel and said, why can't we have this American evangelist to come in? He said they had Billy Graham up there and said, why can't we have this brother come in? And so the colonel said, uh, well, I don't see why you can't. He said, who is the preacher? He said, it's Brother Branham. He said, Brother Branham said he prayed for my mother and she was healed in America. So, Brother, that opened the door. Didn't make any difference to what they said. <laughs> that opened the door. So they threw the door open and... And we went right on in and had the meeting. The first night, to get in and out of the, the crowd, we wouldn't, we wouldn't preach divine healing. We stayed right away from it. Just wouldn't pray for the sick. First, we got them on the gospel first, to be sure. So in order to get me out to keep me from being shot from the bushes, they take a man and just milling around and around me like that so that they couldn't get an aim on me, you see. So I got in and we was attacked the first night with all these fanatics and and I got into the car all right. Billy, I had to grab him to get him in because somebody just about had him. And so then, um, so when we got in, then on the second, third night, we started praying for the sick. And that night, they brought to the platform one of the sweetest experiences that I've had in all my life. A little girl. Now, it is not. Now, this rudeness is not the German people. They're the nicest people I ever met in my life. I tell you, if I lived anywhere else besides America, I'd take Germany any time. And they're humble. They're way better than the Swiss. The Swiss is all right, but the Swiss has never had any trouble, just like American sure, you see. we we never been bombed over here or anything. We just, war comes along, we live off the riches of the land, and the boys goes over and dies, and come back, we never see it. But them Germans has been beat to the ground where their mothers would burn with gas in their arms and you find their mummy skulls laying there with the baby pressed to her bosom like that. They know what prayer means. And they're humble and willing. And so that night in the meeting, all the newspapers sitting around and everything and all the churches criticizing and sponsored by none of them. So we just set up the meeting and thousands even couldn't even gain the place to get to the tent, the place where we were at. And there... While the Holy Spirit was moving, the inspiration come on, there's a lady laying there and told her her backbone was eaten too with tuberculosis strapped on a bowl. I said, unstrap her. And a doctor raised up and said, oh, you can't do that. I said, unstrap her for thus saith the Lord. <laughs> up she got and run through that building with just as perfect and normal as she could be. And her, her, she was barefoot and come to the platform about... Fifteen minutes after that, they started the prayer line going on, and along come a little girl about six years old, or eight years old, about the age of my little Becky, two long plaits hanging down her back, and she almost went off the platform. They caught her and brought over, and when she got to me, she started putting her, had her little head down here, and she started putting her little hands around me like that, and she was blind, been born blind. She never had seen. And when we had prayer for her... Honest friends, I believe if I'd been the worst hypocrite in the world, God would have honored that child's faith. Put her arms around like that and had her little head laid over on my bosom, and I prayed for her. And I said to the Lord, I left Becky and them crying at home, you know, but I, you sent me here to pray for this child, I believe. And when I raised her little head up, she looked around. She said, what are those things? I said, it's life, honey. See? And she, the interpreter told her. So then... She, she could see, and her mother began screaming and runs the platform, and she had never seen her mother before. She began patting her on the cheeks. She said, are you my mother? She said, you're so sweet. And like that, she had never seen her mother before in her life. And then here come a man. The next one was a man that was born deaf and dumb, about 55 years old, never spoke or heard in his life. And when the hearing and speech come to him, and uh, he, they talk on their fingers to him, you know, and I uh, said to him, talk now and tell him to say just what he, I say. And I said, Mama. He said, Mama. I said, I love Jesus. He said, I love Jesus. And the translator, was, he was a German speaking English because that's the only thing he'd ever heard, you see. was right then the only thing he could say was, was English. See, he could speak English same as he could German. He's just born in Germany. So you get what I mean? He could speak English because that's all he'd ever heard. It was me speaking to him, see. I'd say, say, Mama. He'd say, Mama. I'd say, say, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I'd say, praise the Lord. I'd say, praise the Lord. 
And the translator would have to say back to this German, to the Germans, translated from English back to German. <laughs> yes, well, the next day the paper really lit up everything. So the state church ministers, a group of them come down, and they want to have a breakfast with me, and about 200, 300 come down, oh, I guess something maybe like this tabernacle full of people. They come down to a great hotel, and they said if it could be proven to be the truth that it wasn't witchcraft, mercy said if it wasn't witchcraft well they would be ready to protest against the church and come out if they wouldn't accept it so um I got down there and I said brother in witchcraft it's absolutely totally impossible for any demon to have anything to do with divine healing I said I'll I'll defy that from anywhere Every scripture is against it, and there's no power but the devil at all to make any divine healing. I said, there's nothing in the devil can heal. If it is, Jesus said himself, if Satan can cast out Satan, then his kingdom's divided and can't stand. See? He can't cast out Satan. The healing comes only from Jesus Christ. And so they sat there a little while, and they said, well, we can't understand about these visions. We, uh, we just don't know. So we're, what we think... As you'll have to clear us up on this, that we think that um, what it is that you go around in daytime to these houses and give the people their prayer cards and bring them up to the platform at nighttime, and then you've talked to them and you know what their diseases are all about their life. I said, brother, I can't speak German. I can't look here. I said, when I'm given the vision, I can't even say their name. I have to spell it out. It would spell out their names and their places where they come from, like. W-X-Y-O-P-Q-R, something like that, being their name. I said, how do I ask the people? Find out from them. Why well, said the boys give the prayer cards right in the meeting. And what's all, all those that don't even have prayer cards? Well, they said, well, could that be the devil doing that? I said, can the devil heal? I said, if it, uh, I said could it be mental telepathy, they said? I said, well, can mental telepathy make the blind to see? I said, didn't they say the same thing about our Lord? When they said, well, this man has a devil, they see him foretelling things and telling people. They said he has a devil. And the Pharisees raised up and said, another group of them said, can the devil make the blind to see? No, sir, it cannot. So then in the breakfast that morning, they had a great German photographer there to take the pictures of the breakfast. Now, we all are aware that our cameras are little amateurs upside of the German lens. Anyone knows that who buys telescopes or German... Well, for instance, our little Argus camera. I got one. $69 buys it with all the equipment to it. And it's, that's a 35 millimeter. All right. The German Laka in a 35 millimeter costs $500. That's just the difference between $69 and $500. Oh, it's far beyond anything our, their lens are in ours. And they had a great camera setting up there taking the pictures of the meeting, of the... Uh, of the breakfast. And they was asking about how that inspiration, they said, well, we feel that it's some kind of a setup. It's something or another that, that you have. It's a mental telepathy that Germans can maybe look on their cards or something or other, and they can transfer that to you. I said, then how's the healing coming? I said, who foretells these things? Who, uh, what? It's going to come. Well, so maybe that's mental telepathy also. And I said, then you don't believe in God. Oh, we believe in God, sure, we believe in God, but we don't. I said, brother, you're, you're just born blind, that's all, see? You, you were born blind, and I doubt whether you ever receive your sight or not. And I said, it's, I'd rather be physical blind and to be spiritual blind like that. Well, I said, you'd be far better off if you were ever one totally blind, had to be led around with your eyes, by your arms, so you didn't have no eyes. Let somebody be your eyes to lead you. I said, you'd be far better off. But I said, because you see the thing that prophets as long to see. You see the things that great men long to see, and still you won't believe it. I said, well, did Isaiah speak of you, right? Then you have eyes and can't see and ears and can't hear. Amen. And about, they said, well, if uh, that picture of the angel of the Lord that you have on the platform over there said, what about that? I said, that's proof, scientific proof that Jesus Christ still lives and reigns. I said, that's the same pillar of fire or light that followed the children of Israel and brought them through the wilderness and uh, taken them to the promised land. And any reader knows that that was the angel of the covenant, which was Jesus Christ. 
And I said, he was with the Father before the foundation of the world. He's always been, and he's the same today. Or said, we've heard of your American fantastic divine healing service and things. I said, I'm not talking about them. That's not the subject. I'm talking about my own ministry now. Them brothers can defend theirs. But I said, I'm talking about my own. See? And he said, well, we heard all that stuff and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you want to believe, you're a believer. If you don't, then you're not a believer. That's all. And I said, I can't explain it. There's no need of me trying it. For if I try to, I would try to explain God. And who can explain God? And God has made it so that none of us can explain God. We believe God by faith, not by sight, not by knowledge, but by faith we believe God. God is, has to be accepted by faith, in, unexplainable. Amen. You have to receive it. If it's explainable, then you don't no more have to use faith if you can explain it. Amen. See, you don't have to. You can Amen. tell the detail. How many understand that, do you think? You cannot explain God. You have to believe God. It's a mystery to you, but you have to accept it. That's on the basis of your faith to accept something that you cannot explain. Amen. Amen. That's the way it is. That's it. See, you have to explain something and believe something that, I mean, believe something that you cannot explain. It's impossible to explain it. Well, they sit and scratch one of their heads, and, oh, you know how the sovereignty of God always is on the job, isn't he? Amen. No matter what takes place, God's on the job. Right at that very crucial moment, right at the time when hundreds of those pastors of the state church sitting there at this breakfast, this big German camera sitting there, he'd snap the picture and roll a roller, turn it over, just like a 35 millimeter only that big, great big camera taking all that, kept stamping, rolling, kept taking pictures. And about that time, I said, just a moment, the one that I'm speaking of is here now. I said, he's, he's here present. I said, I see it. And he's moving. Well, the German moved his camera right in like that. He said, I'll try it. He shot the picture. I said, it's this man standing right here. He's a leader of 32,000 communists. And, there, and the interpreter gave it to him. I said, he's not a German. I said, he's an Italian. He comes from Italy. And I said, he's not a German at all. And that was the truth, he said. And I said, you just recently come, become converted. Yes. I said, you picked up a Bible. You was raised a Catholic. Yeah. And you picked up a Bible. And you took the Bible and you read it. And God convinced that it was Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Yeah. And you, you accepted it. He said, that's right. And I said, now you are hid from the Catholic Church and got an orphanage way up in the mountains. He said, that's right. And I said, the reason you're not eating your breakfast is because that you got such a stomach trouble that you can't eat breakfast. That was right. And started weeping. I said, but thus saith the Lord, you're healed. He said, that's right. That's right. And they took the picture. And they took, and that camera standing there now, taking that picture, each one, and he shot three pictures of the angel of the Lord, and then took five or six afterwards, five or six before, and it showed up in the nag in the camera again. The angel of the Lord are coming down when it come started down, when it come over me, and when it's leaving. And I got him right here on the platform this morning, which swept all the German papers and everywhere else, and I got it right here now for the pictures of the angel of the Lord. Oh man. The Lord Jesus never fails. Heavens and earth will pass away, he said, but my word will not pass away. He said, I, the Lord, have planted it. I'll water it day and night. Hallelujah. Let some should pluck from my hand. I'll water it day and night. Now, I got a whole group of them here. There's about two dozen. But here is a picture. The one I hold up like this, and maybe... After the service, I'll have Brother Neville, if he wants to take care of that, he can show it to you after the services. And now, um, now here is the picture of the ministerial breakfast. Now you can see how the lights are up here, how the room looks, and there's just about six after, before this and six afterwards. Now, there it is. This is me standing right here. That's the interpreter, and that's Dr. Guggenbuehl, and that's Brother Bosworth. These are all state church pastors, groups of them. All right. Now, 
when it, when it struck, that shows you. See, there's no light or nothing in there. See, when it struck. Now, when I stood up and said, Stand to your feet, the angel of the Lord is here. Here it is. <laughs> now, that's when it's coming down. You see, here I am standing right here. It's coming down. They got the picture of it ascending, coming down from the ceiling, like right? Coming down, you see everybody looking. And this picture here is looking sideways. You hear this man here with his collar turned around. And it's a man that's talking to him, see? That's the one that's giving and talking to here, see? And he's watching. I said, the visions of this man standing right across here. I said, what kind of prayer cards you got? See? <laughs> there you are. There you are. Now, here it is. When it's already come down, and you can't see nothing but just my shoulders there. That's when the vision's going on. When it's telling. And here's where it is. When it's leaving off my face with half my face cut off there with the vision... The angel of the Lord, the glory of the Lord, going off. See it right there? And here it is after it was over. Nowhere at all. So they got it now. It's passed all through Germany. It's coming out through the states and the different religious magazines. There's one coming down. Here's one when it's on. And here's one when it's going away. Oh, he lives. He lives. And Jesus lives today. So in the midst of conflict, don't never worry. He's still God. He always has done it. I have been so thankful for that that I know here at my hometown, it's hard to be understood here, and especially being at home. It's the hardest place in the world. Of course it is. Not to you, my friends, but... Why, didn't Jesus say the same thing? Yes, Among your own? It's, your, it's the worst. Of course, it can't help. The people don't want to be, but they are. The Scripture cannot be nothing but fulfilled. It must be fulfilled. It cannot be broken. The Scriptures must be fulfilled. So Jesus lives today. And friends, this little old tabernacle today with his little crude walls and to the strangers that's in our gates, we most heartily welcome you here in the name of the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ as his beloved children. And we love him and want you to enjoy this fellowship together this morning as we speak on the word of the living God. And I desire solely for you to pray for me. I'm at the crossroads of my life at this time. I have been coming up to this point for a long time, and I finally arrived at this place where I must make a great decision Amen. right away. Amen. So you pray for me. Will you do it? Amen. I'll just give you a little understanding. I've stood between brethren, not representing anything, coming from one to the other. And I have noticed, standing between them, I have uh, brought myself to this place. If uh, I was ordained down here by Dr. Davis, you all know, in the little old Baptist church over here. And now the, I've often told you that I found two classes of people. One of them is the Baptist and the uh, fundamentalist, which has a good mental conception of the Word. On the other side, I find the full gospel, Methodist, Nazarene, Pilgrim Holiness, Pentecostals, all of them. They have the faith. One of them has climbed up to receive the Holy Spirit, and this, but they're so loose with it. They don't know how to control it. And they, the others over here knows the Word and how to place it, but hasn't got no faith with it. If I could only get Pentecostal faith in Baptist theology, what, the church would be set out. That's right. If I could only get it. Those wonderful gifts of Pentecost. It's a shame the way you trot them down and mistreat them and so forth. Here, I'll tell you a little something happened the other day just to show you. I say this because it's a tabernacle. And here it's home. I preach what I want to. See? And, and here are what the Lord tells me to, rather. See? I don't aim to say it's what I want to. I wouldn't say that because I, that would be my own desire. But I, I heard a remark the other day that someone had... had made about a wagon. A fellow saying they had a great meeting and said it, uh, but said there wasn't enough spirit. There wasn't enough noise about it. And the old preacher said, well, so when I used to live on a farm, I went out to the farm 
And I went with uh, my wagon empty, and every time I hit a little bump, it would squeak and crack. Pop, jump, go on. So when I loaded it down with good food and product, I brought it back, and it hit the same bumps and never moved at all. <laughs> a good loaded wagon. <laughs> So what we need today is a good, loaded, solid wagon, knowing where we're going, Amen. led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, some time ago, I tell you what you know what my my theology is: redeeming love. Amen. When you got love one for another, see, no matter what these other things are, how many gifts we got, or how much this we got, or how much that, if we haven't got love one for another, we we're lost. That's all. I went to a fella. Now, brother, I'm using church names here this morning. I don't mean harm by it. But I went to a fellow that belonged to the Assemblies of God. He didn't know me. It's been years ago. I walked up to him. I said, how do you do, sir? He said, how do you do? I said, I understand you're a preacher. He said, I am. And just before the, a great man in the Assemblies of God, he uh, warned me to join the Assemblies of God. He said, come join because we're the biggest Pentecostal organization in the world. I said, that may be so, my brother, but I like to stand between all of you and say we're brothers. See, I said, I may be way off the road on some of mine. You may be too, but let's be brothers anyhow. See, let's be brothers. And he said, oh, you said, all right, we got the church. So I just happened to investigate. I went up to a fellow. I just taken the negative side on both sides to test out. I went up to a bro- this brother and I said, I hear that you belong to the assemblies of God, of ministry. He said, I am. He said, what are you? I said, I'm a Baptist. And he said, uh, well, um, have you received the Holy Ghost? I said, yes. I said, I received the Holy Ghost. He said, you speak in tongues? I said, yeah. yeah. I spoke in tongues. He said, brother, you got it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's it. I said, yeah. I said, I received the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues and for the evidence of it. And I said, uh, he said, oh, you'll come out of that old stiff form of Baptist church then. Hallelujah. And he spoke in tongues a few times. I said, yeah, I received the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Jesus Christ's name. And he said, you what? And I said, I received the Holy Ghost and was baptized in Jesus Christ's name. He said, you don't get the Holy Ghost like that. I said, you told me a little too late. I said, I done done it. <laughs> so he said, um, and uh, I said, I, 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 just, I just done done that. And he said, uh, oh, you can't get that like that. I said, you believe that kind of heresy? See, I, I said, oh, I wouldn't call it heresy. I said, uh, it teaches in the Bible. He said, get out of my house. I don't even want nothing to do with you. I said, okay. The Lord be with you, brother. Walked out. Not long ago, an old Baptist preacher out there on my first trip to Phoenix, Curtis. I went to see this old boy. Walked into him. And I said, uh, how do you do, sir? He said, how do you do? I said, I hear you're a Baptist preacher. Way back over there, the time that little old boy back over in that place was healed with that lung trouble back, well, where that two burglar place is back there. I forget the name of the place. And um, so I he said, I hear you're a Baptist preacher. He said, yeah. I said, have you received the Holy Ghost? He said, well, what are you, Pentecost? And I said, yeah, I'm Pentecost. I was a Baptist in the other end, but I said, Pentecost to this one. I said, yeah. I said, I'm Pentecost. I said, you got the Holy Ghost, evidence, speaking in tongues. He said, Hmm? He said, well, he said, I'll tell you, brother. He said, that's all right. He said, but, you know, I never did just, uh, somehow I just never could see it just like that. He said, and I said, oh, you hadn't got nothing then. That's all there is to it. You ain't got a thing unless you do it. That's all. He walked over to me, took hold of my hand, looked me right in the eye, put his arm around me. He said, but we're brothers, aren't we? We're going to heaven, aren't we, brother? I said, yes, brother, it happened to be I'm on your side. <laughs> see? Now, I said, that man proved by that that he did have the Holy Ghost, and the other proved he didn't have the Holy Ghost. Right. See? It's exactly. See? The man had theology. But as soon as I told him something to cross up his theology, then he flew to pieces because he didn't have nothing else but his theology. I crossed this other man's theology, and he had Christ the Holy Man. Amen. <laughs> Oh, my. Be a good wagon. Load it up full of good things and have faith with one another, faith in God and love one another, and the Lord will bless us. Don't you believe so? Amen. Now, before we open this blessed old Bible here, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, so good today to know that Jesus died in our stead to save us from sin. 
and to bring us together as beloved children in the anointing of the Holy Ghost, healing our diseases, forgiving all of our iniquity, who healeth all of our diseases, renewing our youth as he does the eagles, that we can mount up way high. The eagle can go higher than any other bird, because he can see afar off and see things that's coming. We're thankful this morning, Lord, that you put with us the eye of the eagle, the Holy Spirit that looks far off and sees the great time coming when Jesus shall come. All troubles will be over, all sickness will end, all sorrows and death will flee away. We're happy for this and to have the opportunity of living in this great marvelous day now to preach in the gospel. And knowing this, that Satan is making his last punch at the church. He'll never be able to do it after this age. She'll be safely under the wings of her lover after this time. And we realize that he's impersonating in the way of religion. He's doing all kinds of things. And the Bible said he'd be like a roaring lion. Devouring what he would, he'd be so shrewd and cunning that he would deceive the very elect if possible, if possible. But, O oh Lord, thou art the protection of those who flee to thy bosom for a refuge. And we come in Jesus' name, receive us, Lord. Bless the reading of thy word. Bless the people here. So glad, Lord, to be home today to where we don't need a, an interpreter where we don't need someone to translate the language and we think that when we get home to glory they'll need no more translators no more interpreters we'll all speak one great language there Babylon will be in the past then forgotten no more remembrance of it it'll all pass away so Father we pray that in Jesus name that you'll interpret the word to us Bless us, bless every sinner, Lord, that's setting present. May during the time of the preaching of the word, may he be convinced that he's lived wrong and will come, he or she, and give their lives to thee and surrender today, knowing that it's the last day. May the saints be lifted up. May we go from here with a new vision today, going in the strength of the Lord. May the sick go away this morning well. May the preaching of the Word bring it. May every sick person be healed. All those who are very sick, some of them sick, blind, cancer-ridden, heart trouble, all kinds of conditions, thou art the healer, Father. And may you manifest yourself in the Spirit this morning, realizing that there's nothing in a man could heal another. But the healing lays in faith in the Lord Jesus. And may he be so close that everyone today can accept their healing, granted, and accept their salvation above everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I want to take a little text here this morning for just a little talk of a drama. I spoke on this subject once before, and I was asked to do it again at the tabernacle. One day, here recently, I was down in Kentucky, at Camelsville, and sitting in a, a little place there, a little motel, there was a, that night, reading in the scripture, I read a piece of scripture about a very uh, foul woman in the Bible. And she done a great honor to Jesus. And Jesus, to one of those women, once said, This story must be told everywhere this gospel's preached. Right. And I thought, I, I had never spoke on this anywhere. Oh, I believe I'll just try speaking on it in a little drama. And I was asked this morning, by, or a few days ago, rather, if I would come back to the tabernacle and, and speak on this again this morning. And I pray that maybe... Some of you here was down there when I preached on I'll try to approach it from a little different standpoint. And now the, the scripture reading is found over in St. Luke, the seventh chapter, 
and beginning with the 36th verse. I'll read the one verse, then when you go home, you read the rest of it. St. Luke 7, 36. Or maybe I'll read some, some of it, because it's, it's good to read it. You know, the Lord's Word's always yeah. perfect. Yeah. You know, we just watch the ages roll on. Watch science raise up and say, oh, God was mistaken there. In a few years, they come back around and say, you know, he was right. <laughs> it always seems. They scientifically prove he's wrong first. Then you have to tear all the theology down and come back and prove that he was right. See? So God just sits in the heavens and laughs at him, I suppose, and say, oh, my poor little kids, why don't you just come to yourself? Come serve me and just believe what I said about it. See? That's settled. So now I've given you a chance to turn to the Scripture. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went unto the Pharisee's house and sat down at meat. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears and to wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed him with the ointment. Now the Pharisees, which had bidden him, saw it. He spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, you get it? This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner, if he was a prophet. See, that's what they had him there for. And Jesus answered, said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, and one owed 5,000 pieces, and the other a fifty. And when they had when they had nothing to pay, frankly forgave both of them. Tell me, Wara, which of them loved him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he whom he forgive most. And he said, Unto him thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house, thou givest me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou givest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came, has not ceased kissing my feet, my head with oil. Thou didst not anoint. But this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto her, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. For she has loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven thee. And they that sat at meat with him begin to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Right. You know, there's something wrong. To begin with, the picture don't look right somehow. You can just tell there's a little something wrong here. What would this Pharisee want with Jesus? He had nothing for him. He hated him. The Pharisees didn't like Jesus. Why would he be asking him to his dinner for a guest when he hated him? Usually men ask one another to dinner when they love one another. But this Pharisee inviting Jesus, that don't look right, does it? Now, there's just something wrong with the story here somewhere. So now let's not be in no hurry. And let's just look this story over for a little while. Let's take it in a little way of drama. And let's, let's take it over. There's something wrong. 
You know, people have things in common. You know, people who love the Lord, they like to go to church because they, they have things in common. They, they, we have common grounds for things. We come here because we're all believers in this, this way of worship. We believe in divine healing. That's the reason you bring your sick here. You don't go uh, to places that don't believe in divine healing to, to get healed. You go to places where they believe in divine healing. And uh, we believe in worship in the Lord and the Spirit. And that's why you come here. It's because we have it's fellowship. Now, as I've often said, just like you take a little bitty girl and she follows grandma around all the time. Better watch. There's something wrong there. There's too much difference in their age. One's a little six year old and the other seventy. There's something wrong. Now she might be grandma's pet, you see. So that might be, or maybe grandma might have a pocket full of candy, you know. So there's something, the reason that little girl, because why? She won't play with the children, she just follows grandma. There's something, something curious about it. Because little children have things with little children. Little children play with little children. The Bible speaks of that in Isaiah. Little children playing in the streets. Now you take, in Germany there, I've seen the little Americans and the little Germans, all of them playing together. The little German be rattling off German, the little Americans speaking English. But they played together. They were children. They had things in common. Young women have things in common. They associate with young women. They talk about their boyfriends and, and different things. They, they associate with one another. The middle aged, they have their things in common. The old people have their things in common. You take the, the uh, older women, they speak of, uh, about the older women. They have things in common that they talk about. And we have different clubs like the Kiwanis, for instance. The Kiwanis, the man of the city, they meet together and talk together. They have things in common they're interested in, in the social affair of the city. They want to know how they can make it a, a better place and how they can feed the poor and so forth. You see, so they, they have a meeting place. They have things in common. They want to talk about these things, subjects that they wish to talk on. As Mama used to say back there, she used to say, birds of a feather flock together. That, that's a whole lot of truth in that. See, you take, you don't see buzzards and, uh, and doves having any fellowship. They scatter from one another quickly. Why? They have got nothing to talk on. Now, a buzzard could talk to a buzzard about an old dead carcass somewhere. And that's like sinners. They talk about big dances and parties they're going to. Buzzards. So they, they like to talk about those things. But a dove, he, he ain't interested in, in that, that old dead carcass. Let it lay over there. My, I can't stand the smell of it. He gets away from it. See? That's the way Christians talk about wholesome things and good things, and sinners talk about dirty things and honorary things and sing honorary songs. And even if it's so much disgraceful in our America here, to even the people there want to know what kind of women we got in this country. Said all of our songs are dirty songs about our women. Have they got any nice ones over here? And a certain organization had a convention there, paper wrote it up while I was there, and they had to make the young ladies put their jackets over their legs so they could take their pictures to keep from disgracing the, picture, the paper, wearing shorts, and a great religious organization of ours come to Germany. Ah, buzzards. That's right. Birds of a feather flock together. It's too bad. But it's the truth. Now, we're home folks and we want to talk like home folks. We want to, we want to talk to home folks. And now, uh, that's the reason that uh, they don't have any fellowship. Night and day don't have any fellowship. When day comes on, night just fades away. But night can't come on and put, all, put out daylight. When daylight and, daylight, daylight and night can't accept the same time. They can't exist to the same channel. And light is so much stronger than 
then uh, uh, darkness, darkness scatters. Did you ever notice spiders, black widow spiders, serpents, and all kinds of poison things, reptiles? They sneak and crawl at night. Why? They are of darkness. They're of the kingdom of darkness. And they won't associate in the daytime with the mockingbird and different things because they are uh, of darkness. Their works are darkness. They're evil things. Their life in them is evil. If they bite you, it would kill you if you couldn't have some aid right away. And they, they have fellowship in darkness. That's the reason that people today, most of them sleep half a day, run around all night. See? There, it's darkness. That's when evil is done, is in darkness. But Jesus said, you're the children of the light. Walk in the light. And you won't walk in darkness. He that walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. He can't see where he's going. But a man that's walking in light knows where he's going. You might have a lot of stumbles, but we're homeward bound. That's one thing sure. You know where you're going because you're walking in the light. But this fellowship, this Pharisee that invited Jesus, the first thing I want you to know what a Pharisee means. A Pharisee means an actor. Find the Greek word for Pharisee. It means somebody's acting. I don't like that. Actors. We have too much of that in America. Actors. Pretending to be something that you're not. Acting like something that you're not. As Congressman Upshaw used to say, uh, uh, the old slogan he used to say, you're, you're trying to be something that you hate. That's right. You're trying to act like somebody else and you haven't got no business to be. Our American people, for instance, in Hollywood, when I get over there, you find so many people over there that's uh, actors. They stay before the camera so much that when they get on the street, they're acting some in-person or some person or personality of some day gone by, and they get on the street, they find themselves still acting. Pharisee. And it's not only in Hollywood. We have it in Jeffersonville. You're looking at too many televisions. That's what's the matter. Yeah. Right? Uh, Actors. Pharisees. Trying to act like something that you're not. Putting on. You don't only find it around on the streets. You find it in the pulpit. You get fellows going to pulpit. They get a pulpit boy. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, brethren. A pulpit boy. Acting. Pharisee, hypocrite. Talk like you do on the street. Don't try to put on something. I hate to see anybody trying to put on something. A lot of the sisters sometimes. You know, they, like the man, they put on. Go up to the house here and say, John, get over there in the corner. I told you you wasn't going. Yes, my dear. The phone rings. Oh, hello. <laughs> Pharisee. You actor? Quit acting like that. Be yourself. Act normal, natural. People think more of you. Don't try to act like somebody else. You're not. Just be yourself. Put all that put on. Pharisee. Acting like somebody else when you're not. I don't like that. You never know how to take a fellow like that. You don't know where you're standing with him. He don't know where he's standing himself. Because he's something one in his heart and something else in his mouth. So it's the actor. I just don't like it. It just seems to be too much of something that's not right. Putting on. But American people. Let the little girls go out here and see these, these, uh, some of these women from Hollywood put on some kind of a vulgar dress. First thing you know, here she is out on the street. 
Same thing on. Actors. Pharisees. Right. Then you see somebody, a minister, go across the country with a ministry. You find out here comes some Pharisees. Actors. Putting on. Impersonation. It lays in every walk of life. Actors. It's too bad. Won't you just be yourself? God will think more of you. Just be it. Everybody knows what you are anyhow. Your life speaks what you are. So don't act. What does Pharisee want with Jesus? I can't get that in my mind. What did he want with Jesus? He hated him. And here he is going to have a big supper now. Oh my, I can see us walking up and down his great big corners of his home, how they can put on. Walking up and down there, rubbing his chubby fat hands, you know, and the big diamond stud rings all over his fingers. Saying, well, I suppose uh, it's getting about time for me to have my banquet. <clears throat> Perfumed rooms and his Persian rugs on the floor, walking back and forth, this big fat roly poly Pharisee. Walking back and forth, said, Well, now, if I could just get some sort of entertainment, if I could just find something, of course, you know, I'm a well known man. And I stand in good with all the, uh, the upper crust. <laughs> upper crust. That's why people's got their mind on the days, the upper crust. Why do I care about the upper crust? I don't know what Jesus wants me to be. I don't care about the upper crust. Let them take care of themselves. They're buzzards. Pharisees. Acting. Let them alone. Jesus said they're blind leaders of blind. Some man wrote me a letter from over in Germany. He said, come over and let him put some, some sacks over people's heads. And then let me know what was wrong with them. Then he'd, he'd talk with me. I said, tell that old fox. Today I cast out devils and tomorrow I'm made perfect. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Devil. Actor. Here he is walking up now and saying, you know, I am the greatest degree in this city. My word in the Kwanis stands high. And at the temple, everybody looks up to me. I am Dr. Pharisee. Father, I'm the big shot around here. I got plenty of money. Everybody knows it. I live in a mansion. Everybody looks up to me. Oh, why didn't I think of that? I can see him rubbing his hands together. I know what I'll do. I know how I'll get everybody out here to my party, and I'll be the talk of the town. I, that I, 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 I. You know, that's a disease. <laughs> so many people get it. I do. I did. I will. Get out of the way. Where did Jesus belong in this thing? I'll do. I'll do. And I'll have. And I'll say. And I, 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 I. That's all we think about. He said, well, why didn't I think of that before? All right. Dawned on his mind what he was going to do. So it's long, late evening. I see the sun going down. And there's someone, great crowds of people standing around. And they, I see this fellow standing on his toes, and looking over the crowd, and everybody's sitting breathless. They're listening to the words falling from the lips of a man that never a man spoke like that before. He's teaching. Now I see this courier from this Pharisee's house. He's got a commission to run. He's been going all day long, two or three days maybe, coming from way lower Palestine, from up into the northern part, trying to find Jesus. So he finally runs onto him, getting late. He's sweaty, tired, his legs is all full of dust. He's just a flunky at his master's house. 
That's what they were. They had a lot of flunkies just to work for them, do their dirty work and everything. So he, he's standing there all tired, and he's standing on his tiptoes, and whew, at last I found him for my master, the Pharisee. So he, as he's looking, after a while Jesus leaves off his speaking, and he starts praying for the sick. I can see this courier coming, elbowing his way through the crowd. He's trying to get up there. He bumps into somebody. Maybe it was, maybe it was Nathaniel, or was it Philip? I don't know. I wasn't there. But anyhow, he let's dramatize it a minute. I see him bump into him and say, "Sir, I would see your master. I have an important message for him from my master. Could I see him?" Well, first, Philip never paid any attention to him. Causing so many people pressing to get to Jesus and wanting to lay their hands on their children and things, and, and he had a time keeping the people back. So I see him catch him again and say, Master, I have a very important message from my master to your master. Could I speak to him just a moment to give him this message? I'll go. Well, I see Philip trying to get him up there and say, Master, this man seems to come from another country. He comes from some great man, and he's got a message for you. Now I can see the courier as he bows his head to Jesus, and Jesus in a polite way nods his head to the courier. He says, Master, my master, Simon the Pharisee, is making a great banquet at his house. He's a well-known man, and he's having a great dinner, and oh, he can really put on a good dinner, you all know that. And uh, he's inviting you to come down and be his guest at the dinner at a certain such and such a date. Well, I can hear, what would you have done if you'd been standing there? Well, you'd have done the same thing probably they done. He said, oh, no, Lord. No, you don't want to go to that Pharisee. He ain't got no use for you. Look at the thousands of sick people here. While everybody's trying to touch you, Lord. You don't have no time to go down there to that old fat Pharisee down there where he, he, he's just loaded in money, and he, he's, he, he don't need you. Well, you don't have to go down there. Don't go, Lord. I hear Philip say, don't go, Lord. And hear uh, Nathaniel and Peter and them say, oh, Lord, don't, don't do that. That Pharisee doesn't need you. Why, he's, only, he's, got, he's using you for a trump card. He, he, he's got something up his sleeve. He, he, he seeks to play something, and that was true. But in spite of all that, wherever my Lord is invited, he'll go. He said, tell your master at such and such a date, at such and such a time, I'll be there. And the courier bowed his head and started away. Run away back to see his master. How could he do it? What caused him to do that? Just bring that message and standing before the prince of all princes and has a, an audition with him. He has an interview with the king of glory and fails to see his opportunity. He's so tucked up with things of the world, his master's business, until he didn't catch what his opportunity was. Oh, I'd like to take his place. I'd like to get to Jesus sometime. I try to go daily for his, your trouble. But never do I ever leave him when in his presence until I worship him. Why couldn't that courier fall on his knees and say, Now, Lord, first thing I want to do, knowing that I'm standing in your presence and got your attention, forgive me a sinner. That's what he ought to have done. That's what I'd have done, I believe, don't you? I believe I'd ask him to forgive me. Lord, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I'm without hope, without God. I'm just a plunky in the Pharisee's house. Will you forgive me? But no, he had something else to do. He had to take care of the civil things of the world. The civil law. And don't you think that we're just a little too much tucked up with such stuff as that? Oh, we have to polish a car. We can't go to church on Sunday. 
No. Oh, I know Jesus comes to the church, but my, I ain't got time to go over there. If, if I fail to get my oil changed, they may burn my bearings out tomorrow. Burn them out! I'd rather my bearings to be burned out and my soul to torment in hell if you always do Don't miss your opportunity. It's presented to every man and woman in this world daily like that. But they fail to get to see their opportunity. He failed it. There he was. But we got other things to do. The children's got to be taken care of. We can't go to church. Too many kiddies to get ready. Take them anyhow. Well, the, the neighbors will say something. Why do you care what the neighbors say? Use every opportunity. Get to Jesus. That's the main thing. Don't be tucked up with the affairs of the world. We spend too much time on those things. Make your way to Him. And when you get there, pour out your soul. Now say, Lord, I'll serve you next year if you give me a Cadillac instead of this Ford. Lord, I'll do this and this and that and that if you do so and so. Come say, Lord, God, I'm no good. There's nothing in me. Forgive me. I'm a sinner. That's the way to do it. Don't stand off and be an actor. Pharisee. Don't run up with so many civil things, so much little petty stuff that don't mean nothing anyhow. Your automobile and everything you got will perish. Take care of your soul. Get it first. Straighten that up in there. Till that deep, settled peace that passes all understanding comes sinking down into your heart and you feel him kiss away every stain. Amen. Man, brother, nobody has to tell you what to do after that. You know what to do. Yes. If you ever touched him once, no man can ever come in his presence and talk to him and ever go away and be the same person. You're always changed. When you talk to him, there's an impression strikes your soul that you never forget it. How I remember the first talk I had with him. I was 22 years old. I was ashamed to talk to him. I wrote him a letter. I was going to tack it up on a tree in the woods so he could read it. I was so ashamed in my life. And I thought, well, maybe he might not pass by that tree. But maybe he'll hear me if I'll just talk to him. And I got down and said, Mr. Jesus, I want to talk to you a minute. I'm the worst person in the world. I went away a different person. See, that's the way it is. It's your approach to him. And you're realizing your need. But the trouble of it is we're too good. We feel we don't need him. You've got to feel the need of Jesus. You've got to realize that he's He's your only hope. You've got to be so thirsty that you're ready to perish. Then you'll make your way to him. You won't come up with some civil question. You'll come up with the need of your soul. You'll come up and tell him what it's all about. Off goes the courier. Oh, it's all over now. But I'm satisfied too. I've done my master's bidding. You might do your boss's bidding on the job. You might do your husband's bidding about changing curtains or whatever at the house. But what about Jesus' bidding? Pray! (laughs) Certainly. There it is. Get to him. Now the next thing we find. We find him going on. Now in Palestine, when they were making entertainment, only the rich... You have to be in the East once to, to know the East. Then you got a different view of things if you're ever there and look how their customs are. In Palestine, the way they eat, they uh, set a big table out like this, and you don't sit down to eat in Palestine. It ought to be good for you children, like the little girl sitting here in the front with a little blue dress on, a little pink ribbon. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of times little children like kind of lay over on their arm like that and eat, see? You know, after all, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mama don't think it's right now, but and it isn't just adequate today, but it is in Palestine. 
They don't eat on a they don't eat on a, a chair, set in a chair. They lay on a couch and eat. So they have a long table set and they set their couches in slant ways like this, all down long. And each man is sitting something on the order of this. They set the couch in like this. And when they go to eat, they lay down like this, put their hands up like this, and they eat like this. Now you like these like that, but that's the that's the way Jesus sent eat and Now, they lay back there, and they eat, and oh, do they have fine food. My, I imagine this Pharisee could really put on a feed, too. Because remember, he was a rich man, and he got a cut out of every lamb that was offered as a sacrifice. Amen. Yes, sir. The boys slipped the pruning hooks in, and what they brought out belonged to the priest. He could really, he really had money. He was a man of wealth. He was no pauper. He belonged in here in the upper crust. But he invited a pauper. What for? A big hypocrite. He's going to make some fun out of him. I can hear him say, Now, all is setting fun. That holy roller said he'd come to my dinner. Oh, 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 oh. Wonder what Pharisee Jones will think about that. He hates him too. Won't we have some fun? Now, he claims to be a prophet. Oh, oh, oh. He ain't not. So we'll have some fun out of him when he comes. We'll have some fun. That's the way very few rich people today has any time for Jesus. I'm so glad he's mindful of the poor. I won't say all rich people. Some love him. Sure there is. But you take man when he's got houses and lands and cars and everything. He, he's so busy with that, he has got no time for Jesus. And then he deals with a class of people that he just can't accept Jesus. Hallelujah. I think of it today. A man with a great social standing, how could he get on his knees and cry and beg out to God, go down the street testifying? He would ruin, he would spoil his social standing. Who cares about social standing? I want my standing in glory. Amen. Name on the book of life. That's what I want. Who cares about your own social standing? Take your upper crust. Go to be burning to a crust anyhow. So. Go on. There he is. What could I? Oh, want everybody in town come around now. <laughs> you know that poor people down there, they believe in such stuff as that. So all around my house, all the newspapers will pack it. I tell you, I'm going to have a blowout. <laughs> you know that kind of spirit still exists? Oh, sure. Pride. Oh, it's a cursed thing. Pride. Oh, I'll put on my very best ecclesiastical robe. <laughs> And uh, my servants, oh, you ought to see how they dress them servants. My, they're, they're, sometimes they bring the Indians in there, and they're really dressers. They put little bells on the toes of their shoes and their fine ropes. Even when they walk, it, it, it plays music. And they have their platters full of fine spiced lambs and things, and they bring it out like this, one hand behind them like that, and their toes are moving like that, playing music, and they come out and serve it in such a way. Why, if you wasn't hungry, you'd be hungry anyhow. Ooh, it smells wonderful. How they can cook and fix it up. And he said, you know, it's just the time of year that my, I don't believe I'll have it in the house because too many couldn't see me in my best home. See? Hypocrite, Pharisee, actor. A lot of people today have to go to church to show your religion. Oh, my. That's right. I go to church, I'll be a pretty good fellow at church and people think I'm real religious. You Pharisee? Actor? Jesus sees you all the time. He knows where you're at. He knows all you're doing. And here he goes down there then, you know, and he says, I'll just move it out on the uh, out on the piazza, out there in the yard. And you know these great grapes that I got here, these great big white ones, oh they're delicious. Say, I just time it there in full, uh, uh, the harvest is just right. 
and the smell, that aroma coming through there, won't it be beautiful? And I'll set my table out there, and all the people will come around the gates and look around. That's the way the Easter does, and he always gaffing at something. Everything goes on. You don't have to have a crowd by getting a crowd. Just go there and start something. They'll all come. Everybody be right there looking on, you know. Say, so all around my gates and everywhere, the people will be standing. And you know, I'll be the talk of this city for the next year. I'll be, I'll be. <laughs> oh, it'll, it'll, it'll boost me up. See? It'll make me something. Who cares about me? Yeah. You ought to be thinking about Jesus. Yeah. Not what you're going to be when you become a Christian, but what are you going to do for Christ when you become a Christian? Yeah. I'll go to church, I'll join, and I'll be sprinkled or whatever you do and take you into church and shake hands and put my name on the book, and I'll be considered a, a better person. I'll be considered. Is that all you come to Christ for? Shame on you. Actor? Pharisee? I've come to Christ to see what I can do for him. i got to do something for him. I want to make him better. Let people see him. Not long ago, the Healy campaign comes to a certain city. The man of the hour. Pictures on the papers, on the walls, all over. Everything. And not Jesus name mentioned once. I said, where did Jesus come in on this? Here's the man of the hour, the man with the heart for the people, the God's man for this and God's man for that. I said, where's Jesus at? I thought he was the man of the hour. I thought he was God's man. Where's he at? That's what it is, a bunch of actors, Pharisees. Amen. Notice, oh, he's going to put it on big out there. And so then at night time when I uh, light the candles and so forth and hang them out in there, and there are soldiers standing by, the guards with their servants with their torches on. Won't it be wonderful and how oh, rubbing his hands and so forth? And then finally, the day arrives. Or the, the great banquet. It's going to be set now. And then they got everybody ready. And after a while, I hear the bells are jingling. And up comes Dr. Ph.D. F.D. So-so D. Jones. Pharisee, the big fella, rolls up there in the church and stops. They've always got a bunch of flunkies around, those rich people. And somebody comes out and takes his horses and, and he takes them over to the stable and feeds them and grooms them. And then he's invited in to the house. Now, in Palestine, the first thing, when a man comes to the house, most of the people in coming in, in, uh, in those days, it was by foot. Their only way of transportation was by walking. And in, uh, in walking on the roads, uh, uh, they have a robe. And the robe uh, comes down to the foot. And the foot is covered by a sandal. And the underneath garment just comes to the knee. And it's cut off here at the knee, the underneath garment, under the robe. And a man, when he's walking, or, or someone, when they're walking like that, that robe, uh, moving along, sweeps up the dust. And the dust settles on the knees, from the knees down, and they become very dirty. They're, that's how Jesus uh, talked of washing feet. See, they, it was a custom, because they were, their feet were dirty. And there's many caravans went out in that day through Palestine, and the roads wasn't like ours, concreted or oiled. It was an um, old, dusty, rugged, rough, rocky road, like an old country path somewhere. And in there, the animals carrying, uh, going through there, the, the animal droppings that uh, fall on the ground, and the birds that come pecking in it and scattering it to go back to dust. And then when you're walking along with that road like that, over the rough, rugged road, well, the dirt would fly up and get on your, your leg, and it smelled, had an awful smell, like around a stable or something. And when a person come to the, to the house, the custom was first to wash his feet. Now, I'll show you how that was done. And uh, come here, Brother Neville. I, I, I want to illustrate this to show how it was done. The, come right here, if you will. Now, just be seated there a minute. Now, the first thing come in, and the lowest paid flunky of the whole group was a foot washer. Yeah. The man who washed the feet was the worst of all of them. The lowest paid. Now I want to say something to you. Yeah. Jesus took the lowest place. Yeah. A flunky. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. 
That proves to me he was God. He took the lowest place to wash feet. Had all kinds of flunkies, but the lowest one was a foot washer. Washing that manure and everything off their feet. The lowest flunky there was. And Jesus took the lowest flunky. Man, you're so stiff. You can't do nothing for me. But he took the lowest place for you. He was a foot washer. Think of it. The king of glory became a foot washer to show humility and to give you an example of what to do and how to do it. And you call yourself a Christian and so starchy, you couldn't reach down to shake hands with a beggar on the street and talk to him about the law. Oh, no. oh you're yeah. so good. Find out there ain't much good about it. Right. When you think of him becoming a foot-washed flunky, the lowest there was. He really in heart was the highest there was. Amen. He was the heart of God. And become the lowest played foot wash flunky. Hmm. He who was great becomes put off that he might redeem you back and make you great. Okay. You know what? I've noticed this in my travels. You usually find great men are little men. I go around where these great men, really great men, and I know they're great men. But when I start to leave them, they make you think you're the great man. They ain't nothing. But you take a little two before, don't know nothing. He thinks he's all of it. He ain't nothing to begin with. It's great man or a little man. They never brag or take honor. They make you feel that you're great. That's great man. man. And here's the greatest of man. The greatest of all man. God manifested in flesh. Become a foot wash flunky. For humility. The king of all eternity, all glory. The creator of heavens and earth. Wash the dung off a man's feet. Man. Then we think we're something. We get on a fifty dollar suit and Oh God have mercy on us. We think we're somebody. We walk along with our head up in the air. Oh, I belong to the certain church. I'm as good as anybody there is. Oh, you poor, wretched, miserable hit Pharisee! You're only an actor. You ain't got no salvation. You'd prove it if you did. That's right. Oh, I sent a check in for $50 to charity last year. Who cares for that? God don't look at that. He looks at your heart. You're trying to act like you're something. He never rebukes you for it. But why don't you go out and do something? Just act it. Here, the first thing they done when a man come in, he got walked to the house if he wanted to be really welcome. The host welcomed him. Now the flunky met him at the door. The first thing he done was reach down, take off his shoe, and he tucked his foot like this, like this shirt, and set it up over his foot, and got out and washed his feet like that. Amen. After he washed it off real good, tuck a towel and wiped it. He washed the other feet. He tucked his sandals and set them up on a mantle like this. Up there, then he reaches over and returns and get a nice set of satin sandals, silk or satin, and he takes his foot and it's just dry and fresh and everything, all the dung washed off of him. Then he takes and sticks this on, if it don't fit, he gives him another until he gets it fit on real good. Then he's all washed down, he feels pretty comfortable. Then he goes into a little chamber. This man meets him at the door. Then he goes into a little chamber, there stands another servant, and he has a, a cruise of oil. And oh, it's called sticker. And what a famous stuff that is. And he puts it in a little in his hand, a little in the other hand. He rubs it together, rubs it over his face and over his neck because the direct rays of the Palestinian sun, both men and women, has to keep themselves oiled. It just tear the hide off of you nearly. And their neck and around their cheeks. And this now oil will contaminate. 
that olive oil, if it sits here very long, get an awful smell to it. But they put oh, a spickered perfume in it. And that's a very costly thing. Now, uh, they get it down in, um, in Arabia. You notice a rose, when a rose blooms, and after the bloom is gone, it leaves a little apple where it was at. You've seen that many times, a little, little bud. Now, there's a bush, a famous bush that grows high into the mountains, way down in Arabia. And they take that little bud after the rose is gone, they take that little bud out of there and unshell it, and it's got the most wonderful smell. I've seen one one time. And you could rub it on your hands like that, one of them little buds like that, and you'd smell for two weeks of that perfume. Oh, it's very costly. The Queen of Sheba, when she came to meet Solomon, that was some of her treasures that she brought, some of this famous uh, perfume from down there. And... Um, in Egypt. Now watch. Then they put that in that, and oh, it's very costly. And they put that in there, and they would rub their face and their neck. And then instead of the smell of uh, the odor, his feet was washed. All the dung and stuff was washed from his feet. And there he sits then with the, his face all bathed over and his neck all bathed over. And they give him a towel, and he pats it off like that. And he feels fresh then. Then he goes to the host. Then, now right here, brother, I hope you stand up. Now I'm now, see, he was my guest. Now, the first thing he does when he meets him, he reaches out a hand like this and lays it on his shoulder, and he lays his hand on this shoulder like this. So then what he does, he reaches across and kisses him on the neck. Then he takes that hand down, lays this hand up, and this here, and he kisses him on the neck there. Now, thank you. Now, when he does that, he's kissed, and he's a brother. He's welcome. Hallelujah. He can go in the ice box. Sit down, make his yeah. at home. He's a brother. Hallelujah. His feet's washed. He's, he's refreshed. He's anointed. And he's kissed welcome. Amen. Then he's a brother. He can go right in and feel just as welcome yeah. as in his own house. Now, he goes in and he sits down and he can do anything he wants to. He's welcome. He's washed. He's clean, he's anointed, and he's kissed welcome. That means the host, when he kisses him, he recognizes him as a brother, and he's welcome to anything there is in the house. Amen. He don't have to use any more etiquette. He's at home. He goes right in, goes to icebox or whatever he wants to do, just making himself at home. He's all right then. Now, how did it happen? How could it be? How did that clunky ever let Jesus get by? Here he is sitting at the supper or at the dinner with unwashed feet. He's sitting over in the corner. Oh, I wish I could have been that flunky. I wish I could have took his place. Here's Jesus somehow. Oh, he got Dr. Jones's feet, certainly. He got all the rest of them. He washed them and anointed them. Simon kissed him welcome. And there they are, said, oh, they're so entertained. Oh, Dr. Jones, you know what? Over to so-and-so to the day of Pharisee. So-and-so to you, remember, Pharisee. So-and-so to you, remember. Oh, so busy talking about the affairs till they pay you yeah. to see Jesus come in. And I wonder today if we're not so interested, whether we're Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterian, we pay you on the to see Jesus come in. Oh, God, have mercy. How I'd like to tuck that flunky's place. How I'd like to got out there at his feet. How did he miss it? Oh, he was too interested in what the big churches are doing. Jesus somehow come in. I can hear him say to his disciples before leaving, well, we better go. They had hundreds, about a hundred miles of hot Palestinian roads to travel. But let me give you a part here. Jesus always keeps his promise. Amen. When he said it'd be there, he was there. Hallelujah. I was laying here in the hospital dying. He'd give me a promise he'd be there. He promised he'd heal me. Amen. He kept his promise. Yeah. He said when life's over, when my last battle is fought, and my age is gone from me. I'm getting all over them down to the river Jordan. He Amen. promised he'd be there. Amen. He'll be there. Amen. He keeps every promise. 
I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'll fear no evil. Lord, with me. Won't have to worry. He'll be there. We used to sing a little song here. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Jesus died all my sins to atone. When the darkness I see, he'll be waiting for me. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. I went through a many river here alone. I've been often forsaken by friends, made fun of by friends and relatives. But there's one thing sure. He'll be there. When the time comes, I, he'll be there. He always keeps his promise. Oh, oh you think I'm crazy? Maybe I am. But he'll be there. He left maybe a little early. So he'd be sure to be there. He always keeps his promise. He's right there on time, just as he promised he would be. And they failed to recognize him. They had time for everything else, but they didn't have time for Jesus. Look, when our president comes to the city, look how they welcome him. Yeah. While the president will come to this city, they, from the train to the hotel where he stays, it's strolled with flowers. The flags are all out. Bouquets are thrown in the streets. Flower girls go before. The band beats. The music plays. The singers sing. Everything to make the president feel welcome. But Christians, Jesus comes, and you won't welcome him. Oh, you'll give him a little place in the closet once in a while. A little closet over to one side. You're ashamed of it before your company, huddle. You wouldn't call him to prayer. Oh, he'd take a little place in the closet. Maybe up in the attic. He might take him up in the attic once in a while. When he comes, say, oh, I know he's sure. I'll slip up in the attic. So nobody hear me pray. Mm -hmm. But what's the good part? He comes anyhow. Jesus, will you take second place? Yeah. Will you take third place, Jesus? Yeah. Frankly, I'll just take any place you give me. But you'll welcome the president with everything. You'll welcome your neighbors and cook a big dinner. You'll clean the house. You'll do everything. But when Jesus comes, he takes what he can get. He takes him in the old dusty attic down in the basement somewhere. You remember when you went to church one time before you was a real Christian? About once a year. Oh, you put on your most gorgeous your dress. It was Easter. The little bonnet on the side of your head. You complained because the preacher preached 20 minutes. But he didn't rebuke you for it. He accepted it. You went home, put up your new dress, and said, Well, that's enough religion for a year. But he didn't fuss at you about them. He just accepted it. That's all he could get from you. Sometimes he ain't getting that from you. You give him any place. What part has he got in your life today, Christian? Has he got the best part? Or are you just giving him the attic? Or just a little prayer now and then? What about it? What kind of place are you giving him? There sat Jesus, sitting over by him. His disciples couldn't come in. They wasn't invited. All of them standing around looking on. And there sat Jesus over there, very uncomfortable, smell of the road on him, dirty feet, unanointed face, not just welcome, and sitting over to one side, in the corner, head down, little Pharisee, what do you invite him for, you hypocrite? That's the way it is with your church. You'll pray for a revival when the Holy Ghost comes, you'll push it off. You'll never make it welcome. Somebody gets healed or something that they're filled with the Holy Ghost, you will go around and talk about it. Push him off. You don't want the Holy Ghost no more. You don't want a preacher that preaches the Holy Ghost in sanctification. You don't want it no more. You want some classic, a little half-wit, 
Oh, polish up with a lot of mental theology, with real good grammar and stuff like that. Give me the old passion, God said, Holy Ghost, my Lord Jesus is welcome. He'll bless your heart and he'll shut and choke it down. He won't make him welcome. He wants to be praised, but you won't praise him. But you'll holler, Hello, Mr. President. Hi, Julie. I ain't seen you for a long time. And Jesus comes. You push him over in the corner. Unwelcome. You pray and pray and pray for a revival. And when a revival begins to break out somewhere, you say, Huh, not my church. I had nothing to do with that over there. Oh, you actor. Pride. Hell up in the air. Hypocrite. Shame on you. My Jesus has come to this city many times. And you push him in the corner. You've talked about it. Said it was the devil. Said it was mental telepathy. Said there was nothing to it. Shame on you, hypocrite. Jesus will make it pay for that trouble. He days of the day of judgment. Yeah, he comes to the city. He knocks at the door. He performs things and people don't say, oh, that's nonsense. Push it away. And every night in your church is praying for a revival. Uh, Pharisee. Yeah. Actor. You want it the way you want it. Christ comes in the way that he wants to come. Yeah. He might embarrass your theology. <laughs> there he sits. After he's been invited, and he's come. Hallelujah. How many times have these old cold former morgues around here prayed for a revival? Here today, they're praying all over the country for a revival. Billy Grimm and Jack Shooter and a bunch of them going across the river praying for revivals, and then here come the Holy Ghost down in your market is apostasy. Yeah. Hallelujah! He comes down with the same signs and wonders and everything that proves that he's there. And you call it the devil. Yeah. Hypocrites. You'll die in your television one of these days and go to hell in the same thing. And tonight going on with a bunch of theology from some seminary. Actors. Hypocrites. Amen. Never darken the door. Say, I ain't going to that old church. Never. Oh, you hypocrite. Jesus said him, Jesus, with dirty feet. They call him Jesus in Germany. Jesus with dirty feet. It does something to me to say it. God, Jesus, the invited guest, the Prince of Glory, the fountain of life. And unwelcome with dirty feet, sitting there with dung on his feet from the road, amongst all the rest of them, all polished and smelling good. And there he sits with droop, weary face, the sweat stains on his beard, eyes drooped down, unkissed. Jesus wants to be kissed. There's a scripture in the Bible said, kiss the son, lest he be angry. That's right. Jesus wants to be kissed. Did you ever kiss him? Sure you can. He's sitting there unwelcome. Dirty feet. Jesus. But dirty feet. Oh, don't that make you feel funny? Jesus. Dirty feet. Unwelcome. Look what you do with him today. Instead of bringing him into your big tiny church, you push him off in some little mission down on the corner for the grocery when we even have a grocery. Yeah. It's all contaminated. It's down there in a little monkey place down in a basement somewhere. <laughs> and you pray for him to come. Yeah. And put him in the dirtiest hole you can find. Yeah. God be merciful. Yeah. But blessed be his name. He comes anyhow. They want that up on a car, a little old holy roller tabernacle. He comes anyhow. They ain't nothing goes up there with the poor stuff. That's all right. He comes anyhow. Make him welcome. Now he tries to get to your big church, but you won't let him. You know too much. 
You're too busy with the affairs of the church. You hypocrite. Stand there. Are you inviting him? What you pray for? He said what would take place when the Holy Ghost come? On the day of Pentecost, they prove what he would do when he comes. And he'll come to your church and he'll throw it out. You Pharisee, you actor. You only kind of act what they sprung to do you up at the seminary somewhere. Won't you welcome Jesus? Jesus with dirty feet. Oh, God. Jesus with dirty feet. The loving Savior. Them feet that are soon to be spiked. Them hands unwashed. With feet with dirt and dung on them and rolled and blistered. Dirty feet. Precious hands. Crown the soon to be born crown. Unless it'll catch the creases of the blood as it pours off his face and is sitting amongst those religious people unwelcome. My Jesus with dirty feet. Oh God. Oh, if I could be that lucky. Oh, if I could only come and wash his feet. There he is sitting there. Dirty feet. Unwell. Nobody wants to have anything to do with him. His feet so dirty. So what did he do? What did he do? He come anyhow. He come anyhow. Said, yeah, I'll be there. So he said that he kept his appointment. He'll keep his appointment with you every time. There he's sitting there. Pharisee, sitting there rubbing his hands. Stand now, look. Oh, uh, Jones, you see? Here we are. Didn't know Jesus was sitting there. You think he was uncomfortable? Sure, he was uncomfortable. He didn't know all the people around. He felt uncomfortable. Nobody was making him welcome. So then the first thing you know, what did he do then? What did he say? He sat there like that. Now let's go watch what he does. I look on the outside. Let's look outside. There's everybody looking. Nobody knew who he was. One said, well, where's he at? I look, let's get another scene here. Look, coming down the street, you know, I see a, a little old woman. Oh, what a name she had in the city. She was a sinner. We won't go in details about it. She was a prostitute, a woman of ill fame, the one that did wrong. But remember, brother, she's somebody's daughter. That's right. How do you know what caused that life? Maybe some sweetheart introduced her to such a life. Put her in his arms and promised her everything. And then when he ruined her character, run away and left her to spoil another, and that introduced her to this kind of life. Who knows the story behind her? But now she's marked. No one had anything to do with her. She's roaming the streets, making her money the best she can. I hear her say, look over there at Pharisee's house, wonder what's going on. Of course, she can't come into a crowd like that. That's all out of order for a prostitute to ever come to a place like that. But she gets on the outside. Oh, God. I see her stand on her tiptoes over this big old fellow's shoulders. She's trying to look. She said, well, look at all that good stuff to eat. Oh, my, isn't the rich heaven? Oh, isn't it wonderful? And her eyes fall over there in the corner. Oh, look. That's him. That's him. Oh, she says it can't be like that. His feet's dirty. His face is dirty. Why he isn't he isn't welcome? He's seldom welcome among the rich. She said, I, "Oh, that can't be. Uh, is it really him?" She looks again. Yes, that's him. She turns around. Runs away in the crowd real quick. Down the steps to the street she goes. Up a little pair of creaking steps. As it wiggles as she goes up her little attic. She runs over into her a little chest that she has there. She opens it up and pulls out a little bag. It's got all the money she has. She looks at it. She sets it down and it clinks. She says, I can't. I can't do that. I must be dreaming. There must be something wrong with me. I couldn't go to that feast. 
I just can't do this. Perhaps she takes and puts it back. Oh, but I can't do it. He don't know how I got that money. He's a prophet. He's a seer. He don't know how I got that money. But oh, look, they invited him. He sat there like that. How did they do it? Oh, somebody ought to attend to that. And somebody ought to attend to it today. But they won't do it. You're too well entertained. You have to stay home look the television. You have to go to drive in at night. It's too hot to go to church. Oh, you actors! <laughs> this old harlot, she picks it up again. She said, but I must. Oh, I must be crazy. The tears are pouring down her cheeks. She said, oh, to look at him. To see the way he looked. His sad look, everybody passing by. Nobody making him welcome. He's sitting there as a, as a wallflower. Everybody passing by. That's the way he is today. Everybody passing by. Oh, you got your churches, you got your religion, you got your doctors and so forth. But what about Jesus? He just passed by. Let him sit there like that. She said, I've got to do something about it. I've got to do it. I don't, you know, there's something about women. I wish that God they would use more of it. They some of them they don't stand and wonder like man. We stand and wonder and figure it all out. But women usually go do what's on their heart. She said, I I just got to do it. So I see her get her robes together, pick up a little sock full of this every penny she had, leaving the old shack. She goes down the street real hurry and look over there and she starts into this great perfume shop. And I see this old long hook nosed Jew standing back there counting his money. The things have been dull that day. He said, Oh my, I haven't even made expenses. Haven't even made expenses. All sour and broke up. And the first thing you know, she walks in the door. Now he don't treat her like a lady. He looks out and says, Well, look what's out there. You don't walk out and say, Could I help you do something? He said, Well, what do you want? She said, I want the best alabaster box you've got in the store. Oh, the best you got. Hey. Oh, when he sees the money, it's different now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, the best you got. He is worthy of the best. Oh, yeah. What do you do for him? Give him the leftover. Oh, yes, you run around all day and give him three minutes a night before you go to bed. He deserves your best, friend. He deserves everything you got. But what do you do about it? You give him his anything. He takes it. He takes it anyhow. He takes it. But she said, I want the best. And it cost her everything she had to get the best. That's what you want to do. Give your best. To give him your best. Give him the best of your life. Give him the best of your songs. Give him all your talent. Give him everything you've got. Give him your feet. Give him your hands. Give him your eyes. Give him your mouth. Give him your ears. Give him your soul. Give him your heart. Give him your praise. Give him everything you've got. Hallelujah. He's deserving of the best. She said, I want the best you got. Well, I said, let's see how much money you got first. So he pours the sock out. Counts it out, yep, 280 pieces of Roman in area. That's just exactly what it costs. Then he goes over and gets the box, sets it out to her. Ah, you hear him say, I wonder what she's going to do with that. Here she goes. Out the door, she has to hurry. She's late. It's better late than never, isn't it? You've waited a long time, too. But it's better to come. Don't stay the way you are. Long time you've been wanting to really be a Christian. Wait a long time, it's getting pretty late, that's right. But go anyhow. Let this be the time. Let this morning be the morning. I'm going all the way for Christ now. I got to get there. Here she comes. I can see two men nudging stuff. Look going there. Look going there. Look, I guess she's going to the feast of Pharisee. What if Pharisee invited her? Oh, you're. We Americans are too good. 
We just don't realize how low down we are. That's right. We're too good. We're always better than somebody else. You poor, naked, wretched, miserable hypocrite. Don't you know you're lost? Oh, America, how oh, God would have kept you, but you would not. How he sent you righteous men who preached and lived on sorted crackers and bread sauce, bread and water. And you made fun of them and called them holy roller and pitched them in jail and tore up the places and despised them. Right. Oh, you're too good. You don't, you don't need anything. The Bible said in Revelation, Know you not that you're blind, miserable, wretched, poor, and naked and don't know it? Oh, yes. Yes, lady. You can take and go out here and just fix all up and wear the best of clothes. You can go to the best of churches. You can all fix up and have your hair manicured or what you call it and wear the big high heel shoes and paint all up like a circus and go down to the church and say, well, I'm just as good as they are. Oh, you miserable blind wretch. You don't know that you're lost. Yeah. You think because you got to change your clothes and mister, because you can you know, ride in a good car today and got a good job and the boss pats you on the back, you think you've got everything made. You shun church. You wouldn't go to a place where they went to the altar and prayed. You're ashamed that your neighbors would see you, you poor hypocrite. Don't you know you're lost? You don't want Jesus. You ain't got no room for him. Nudge one another. Look on there. Yeah. They passed me by unnoticed. Or they once passed with a smile. You heard the old song, Now I'm marked. Mark, Mark, I am Mark now wherever I go. I am Mark. Hey, Mark, Mark, what I am, everyone seems to know. Hey, That's right. But I've been sealed, sealed, sealed. I've been sealed by God's Spirit divine. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. I am His, and I know He is mine. <laughs> Go ahead, Lord, if you want to. I'm on the road. Hallelujah. I'm just all by and by. That's right. On the road. Here she goes. She pulls her veil up over her face. Down the street she goes all in hypocrite, nudge him one another. She gets right to her side. She raises up the tears of scald in her cheeks. They see she's been crying. Well, what she's crying? She stops. Outside the angel line, she looks up. She said, Oh, I can't. I can't. Oh, I just can't do this. I can't believe what will he say when he knows what I am? That's a good thing, sinner. He knows what you are. Amen. Come anyhow. Come anyhow. All oh, you Pharisees have been going to church all these times and supposed to be a Christian. He knows what you are. Yeah. You are. He knows who you are. He knows what's on the inside of you. You're ashamed to come to the altar after belonging to church so long. But he knows you. He knows what's on the inside of you. She's top. She said, oh, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. What would he say about a woman like me? What would he say but here they've invited him? It's my opportunity. Yeah. Oh, you don't realize what an opportunity you got. Yeah. You've got an opportunity today, friends, yeah. to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You've got an opportunity today to be a saint of God. Yeah. You don't have to be a, a stinking sinner. You can be a saint. Yeah. You don't have to be a hypocrite. You don't have to be a church and, and a tender and not a Christian. You don't have to go along there and act like you're a Christian and go to church to hide your meanness. You can really be a Christian. You've got an opportunity. And here she is. She says, oh, look. But what would he say if I come? What would he do? But I hear him say, well, one time I heard him preaching. That's it. If you ever hear his words, something's different now. Whoa. Oh, Lord. I heard him down on the banks of Galilee one day. Hey. Put all those other kind of people standing around him. He raised up his precious hands and said, Come unto me, 
all ye that labor in her heavy laden. I'll give you rest. She think, oh, you know it. what I need is rest. My poor wretched soul is burning. And he said, whosoever will. That meant me. That was me. Sure. But look what's standing between me and there. That's what's standing between you and him. The whole lot of imposters standing between you and him. There's a whole lot would keep you away from him. There's a whole lot would tell you it was crazy. They're still standing between you and Jesus, but he said, Come! Hallelujah! Come! She heard it. Brother, you know what she does? She tucked that alabaster box under her arm and she started knocking one one way upon the other. She's elbowing her way through the crowd that she got to Jesus. Could you do that? Oh, your way up, away from unbelief, the days of miracles and prayers, and those such a thing as the Holy Ghost, just keep moving them away. Making her way till she got to him. Now here she stands. She's standing before Jesus. The only place that she could ever find rest to her soul. She's helpless. She falls down. She falls on the ground. She starts boohooing and crying. The tears are running down her cheeks. Oh, she's so guilty. And she's so sad to see that him say there in dirty feet at the ba- banquet and dirty feet. And she's t- crying. And the first thing you know, she gets beside herself. She don't know what she's doing. God help us to get beside herself once in a while in order to get to Jesus to get saved. Brother, I remember when I come to him, I got beside myself. I didn't care who was around. I cried. I shouted. I praised the Lord. I didn't care who was anyway. I was beside myself. God help us to push aside these old dry creeds and denominations so we can get to Jesus and get saved. She was beside herself. The tears were rolling down her cheeks. The first thing you know, she is so beside herself. She is standing with a fountain of love. And she was so beside herself till she found out she was washing his feet with the tears that run down off of her face. Oh, what beautiful water! What beautiful water! Tears from the penitentiary washing Jesus' dirty feet. Tears from a penitentiary washing Jesus' dirty feet. She beside herself, she was rubbing his feet. She just didn't know what to do. Her heart was so happy that she had the opportunity to stand in his presence. She was washing his feet with her tears. <laughs> just rubbing him. And the first thing you know, she got so excited and so beside herself until she, her hair fell down. She had all of her curls done up you know, on top of her head and her hair fell down. <laughs> and she began to wipe his feet with her hairs. Oh, what a dying towel. Listen, if some of the women these days who try to wash his feet and wipe with their hair, they have to stand on their head to do so. They cut their hair off. That's right. Remember, wait a minute. I didn't say that for a joke. This is no joke in time. Let me tell you something. That's the Bible. The Bible said a woman's hair is her glory. That's right. And look, what happened? The only decent thing she had about her was her long hair. And it fell down at her feet, at his feet. She laid her glory at his feet. She was wiping his feet with her glory. Hallelujah. God helps us to do the same thing. Wiping his feet, bathing with the tears of water from the fountain of a penitent heart. From her heart pouring out tears. Oh, God, I'm so wretched. I'm so miserable, Lord. Oh, God. And her glory lay in my decision. Why did I feed up with your glory? What a picture. What a picture of salvation. Tears from her eyes washing his feet. The glory, the only decent thing she had, she was wiping him with it. Oh, my. She raises up. She couldn't get up. She's halfway up. The tears are streaking down her cheeks. 
sisters like cows running off of her case, and she's washing his feet, and she picks up this alabaster box. She breaks the top of the, the, the off of it, and she pours it all. <laughs> Not just sprinkling his feet, she pours it all. <laughs> living, all of her glory, all of her money, all of her everything, and even all of her heart pouring with tears, she lays it at the feet of Jesus. Oh, you poor church member, miserable hypocrite, that are all that so starchy and indifferent. Don't you see what this poor prostitute was doing? She was laying everything at Jesus' feet. She wanted to be welcome. Amen. What's happened to the party? Who cares what's happened to the party? I'm not interested in the party. I'm interested in a sinner coming to Christ. Amen. No matter how she gets there, just so she arrives. Amen. The old party, that's her trouble of the day. So busy with the parties and they eat soup, suppers, entertainments, and baseball games, and bump calling the church and everything. You, you let Jesus go out. Oh, what a pity. Here is the party's all, all broke up. Look at them all standing around gapping looking. Now look at Pharisee punch the other. Say, you see, if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman that was standing by. See, I told you he was a prophet. He, I know how to hit that poor woman. She couldn't even hear it. She was so happy. She had to think, what if he would move his foot? Would he move his foot? If she had if he had moved one foot, she'd been gone. But you know, he never. He was enjoying it. He was enjoying the service to him. He was enjoying somebody loved him that much. He just kept real still. And she'd take one foot and then he'd And she was, I kiss this the other. He's beside himself. Oh, God, I wish we could get like that. The second you see, well, then the first thing you know, Oh, Pharisee said, see, I told you he wasn't a prophet. He would have known. said, look, that woman will even ruin his reputation. Oh, how blind. Oh, oh pride is such an evil thing. Listen, she, he thought that woman would ruin his reputation. Well, brother, Jesus' reputation is made in the presence of sinners. That's where his reputation is made. Not amongst the starch and stiff, but amongst sinners. Who is willing to repent? Amen. That's where Jesus' reputation is made. When sinners will come to him. And there she is. She's got his feet washed. She's just kissing his precious feet. Saying, oh God, thank God I'm kissing right now. After all, a big old spike's going to be drawn through there for the shedding of blood for my sin. I'm kissing his feet and going on. And Simon stood back there. <coughs> oh, I can see him turn red in the face and then white with rage. Ooh, my. Jesus turns around and says, Simon, I got something to say to you. <laughs> I've got something to say to you. I come to your house at your bidding. You bid me to come. And you never give me any water to wash my feet. Said so I come to your chamber and you never give me any oil to anoint myself with. You said you didn't even kiss me. You didn't make me welcome. Oh, God. Amen. Random tabernacle, wake out. Amen. You didn't wash my feet. You told me to come and you didn't wash my feet. You let me sit here embarrassed. I wanted to be something for you, but you wouldn't let me. You didn't wash my feet. You never give me any oil to anoint my face with their burning. My cheeks are burning. I've traveled two days through the hot sun. You never give me any anointing oil to help my poor parched face. My feet's dirty and stinking, and you didn't give me any water to wash with. And you didn't even kiss me to make me welcome. Um, but is that this poor woman, ever since she's come into this building, she hasn't ceased kissing my feet. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to do that too. Yes. Then I say unto you, to the woman, 
your sins, which are many, are all forgiven you. <laughs> What good your old staunchy church you going to do? What good the old paper you got your name wrote on going to do you? You better make Jesus welcome. Make you a little starch out of you. Amen. That our sins, which are many, are all forgiven me. <laughs> hey. I just can't preach some more. I think. <laughs> Five sins which were many are all forgiven. Go and please that. Her standing there, her cheeks stained, her eyes bare, the oil over her mouth, and her face from kissing and feet washing the body, the tears running down her cheeks, her hair hanging down, soaking with the manure and dust and dung off on the road, hanging in her hair where she wiped his feet. And you hear that word. You've embarrassed yourself in here. Now your sins are all forgiven. <laughs> My sins are all forgiven. Go in peace. Oh, God. I want to stand there. I want to do that too. Some glorious day when it's all over, I'll preach my last sermon. I'm getting old now. I realize I said to the boys this morning, I said, I'm already 46 years old. Oh, I've got to do something for God. I can't be here too much longer. Nature shows that. And I said, 20, 20 years before I would be. Life's a fading. It's going away. I can tell it. But one day when it's all over, I don't own no mansion. <laughs> I don't want no big stuff in heaven. I want to crawl up to them same feet. <laughs> Look down there and pat him a little bit with my hands. Kiss him out on his foot and say, Oh, Jesus. <laughs> say, You love me when my path is so dim. When I was so in need, Lord, it's so indifferent you love me then. <laughs> You the one who brought me through Jesus. Oh, I love you, I love you. <laughs> oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. Them feet were scarred for me, Jesus. I love you, I love you. <laughs> oh. I don't want to catch him like that. So now, Master, you know all about it. I feel like then I should go away. That, that would that pay me forever toil the road. Hey. The toils of life may be many. They may be cold. Yeah. How little it will seem in that morning when we walk up the streets of gold. Hey. <laughs> There's so many hills to climb upward. I'm off this way. But one day when I get there and cross my last forehead, if I can just see him then, Pat his feet and make him welcome. Amen. Let him say, Lord Jesus, oh, I'm so glad that you love me when I was so sinful. Amen. I'm so glad you kept me when I couldn't do nothing else. Lord, you just love me. When I was sick, you healed me, Lord. When I was a sinner, you forgive me. Oh, blessed Jesus, let me pat your dear feet again. <laughs> I just can't preach no more. Let's bow our head just a moment while the pianist come up with you. Dear Jesus, oh, Jesus, the dirty feet. <laughs> the cold world is different, making you so unwelcome. Jesus, what can I do, dear God? What can I do? <laughs> I want to meet you someday, Lord. I want to pat your precious feet and say, Lord, you love me. You were scarred for me. You were wounded for my transgressions, and with your stripes I was healed. I love you so, Lord, because you love me. Won't you, Lord, let us all do that? Granted, Father, while we have our heads bowed,
I wonder if you would think now, would you raise your hand just a minute ever who say, Brother Branham, I've been a sinner. I want to accept Jesus now. I've invited him to my house, Brother Branham. I've kind of been ashamed of him before my people. God bless you, Mother. I've invited him to my house. I haven't entertained him. I've been just a little bit ashamed of it. I'd see my neighbors come in. It's time for me to go pray. I just let it go by. I wouldn't say nothing. I'm ashamed, brother. Am I just that? Jesus, I'm ashamed. I'm going to raise my hand up to you, Jesus. Now, you forgive me. I'm not entertained you like I should. God bless you, young man. Someone else raise your hand. Say, God, be merciful to me. God bless you, fellow. God bless you, lady. <laughs> Jesus is here. He's here just as much as he ever was. He's here just the same as he was at the banquet of the Pharisee. We invited him to come in this morning. Here he is. And you kind of shame yourself. Don't you want them tears running down your cheeks to say this to him, Lord, I'm ashamed. I, I don't want to be indifferent. I, I, I want to love you. I want to do everything. You slip up your hand to him and say, by this, Lord, God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. God bless you, 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 sister. Look at Jesus. Nail scarred Amen. God bless you, brother. Come on, Elsie, just raise your hand. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. Just keep your head bowed while God's talking, huh? Rock of Ages.
Trinity, would you come forward to the altar to pray? The altar is open for all who want to come now to receive Christ as your Savior. Move up around the altar and pray. Would you do it? If there's no room around the altar, stand around the aisle, and we're going to pray in a few moments. I will sing it again. When I rise to worlds unknown, and behold me on thy throne, Rock of Ages, remember me almost Sunday morning at the Phantom Tabernacle when I come to the altar. I see you on entertain. I come to give you my life. I come to dedicate my life to you anew. If there's anybody here who wants to dedicate their life to you, come now. Wow.